The defense says, hey, it's not Jackson who was the predator. It was Jackson who was the prey. And the alleged victim and his mother were the predators. They saw an easy mark. They saw a guy who liked young kids and wanted to be around them, and they saw the money. They had done it before, argued Mesereau. He brought to the stand newspaper editor Connie Keenan, who'd received a phone call from the accuser's mother. Her son was ill with cancer, and they were losing their house, and they were losing their car because of the medical expenses. Keenan felt sorry for the sick boy and eventually agreed to run a story. A few weeks later, the mother called again. She said, you know what? We didn't make enough money from the first story. Will you run another story? The mother's phone call prompted the reporter to carry out more research on the family. She was stunned and shaken to learn that the family was insured and their medical expenses had been covered all along. It gives me goosebumps. It does. It does that a mother would use her son to, to use her son's illness for their own gain. The mother had testified that she'd been held hostage at Neverland. Mesereau was able to produce a witness who'd in fact given her a spa treatment at that time. Did she call for help? No. Did she tell the person at the spa that she was being held against her will? No. What did she do? She had a body wax. She went on shopping sprees and even had dental surgery, never once mentioning that she was being held captive. The defense knew that its attack on the mother would stick, thanks to the work of chief investigator Scott Ross. He'd uncovered a grifter scheme, in which the accuser's mother taught her children how to con money from people. She taught them what to say and they said it. They had typed out notes that they would come home every day from school and they would read from them. These kids were taught to disarm people, there was a consistent statement made by almost every witness that had dealings with the family that these kids would come up and greet them with a hug. These kids would write cards, we love you, uh, you're like a big sister to us, can we come stay at your house? This was a pattern that they had set. When the kids procured money, says Ross, the mother would put it in a special bank account. She was the only one that had access to it. She was the only signer. She was filtering money through it. Throughout the trial, the defense successfully portrayed the accuser as an astute young liar, scripted by his mother. After repeated stays at Neverland, even while Michael was out of town, they began to exhibit an attitude of entitlement with Michael's staff and resources. Witnesses at the trial reported that they thought the family started conspiring to take advantage of Michael and his generosity. At first glance, the Arvizos seemed like well-intentioned, kind, fun people who had grown up in difficult circumstances in East L.A. and that they deserved the help they got. However, it came out at trial that the Arvizos were not as innocent as they first appeared. Trial testimony revealed that a couple years earlier, before his cancer diagnosis, Gavin was arrested for shoplifting at a J.C. Penney on an outing with his family. When a security guard confronted him in the parking lot, they got into an altercation and Janet Arvizo was arrested. Some weeks later, Janet Arvizo sued J.C. Penney, claiming she was sexually molested by the J.C. Penney security guards. She said they twisted her nipple up to 25 times and beat her, and she offered these photos as proof. J.C. Penney settled out of court for $152,000. Well, there's no question that two young boys lied under oath to support their mother's claim that she'd been sexually abused by J.C. Penney guards. But there are many other things that we brought forward. Uh, she was arrested, brought to the police station. We obtained the booking information where she said she didn't have any need for medical attention, didn't have any injuries. We also obtained the booking photos where you didn't see a bruise on her body or a hair out of place. Subsequently, her lawyer filed a lawsuit against J.C. Penney and with photographs showing bruises all over her body. Later, Janet and her kids admitted under oath that her ex-husband David regularly beat her and their children and that they had lied earlier in the J.C. Penney deposition. Apparently, the Arvizos were practiced in using lawyers and their children's lies for financial gain before they met Michael Jackson. The family apparently was aware of prior allegations that had been made against Michael in the past and had hinted that there was really nothing keeping them from doing something similar unless 
My understanding was they were very concerned and upset that they were not compensated for the Bashir documentary which had aired. So you're saying before any of these allegations were made that Michael Jackson was worried that there were going to be false allegations made? I think he, from what he saw of this family, I think he had come to the realization that they were probably capable of just about anything. What were you asked to do? I was asked to find out where they were, get in contact with them, let them know that I wanted to meet with them, talk to them, and get an idea of what was going on because my understanding was all of a sudden they had just disappeared from Neverland in the middle of the night. And so are they sending the private eye out there to monitor them? It, was, it certainly wasn't to control them in any way. It was to just keep a real loose watch on who they were meeting with and what they were doing. We then decided that before this goes any further, perhaps it's time to get a sworn statement from them stating what the circumstances were. If anything ever did happen, if it didn't, so you wanted a, a sworn statement just in case? Just in case, almost like an insurance policy. Uh, it was arranged for a few evenings later that I went over to the um, apartment of the mother's boyfriend in Los Angeles and uh, was welcomed, hugged by every member of the family. What did you say? I asked um, each of them if anything had ever anything improper had ever happened I asked about sleeping arrangements there and was told by the two sons that neither one of them ever slept alone in Michael's room without the other one being present that nothing ever happened nothing out of the ordinary nothing sexual you asked nothing them specifically did anything sexual ever happen? I believe I asked if they were ever inappropriately touched or anything along those lines. And I was told absolutely not that Michael was like a father. He was the only father the children had known. No intimidation at all to make her make this tape? Absolutely none, Dan. You're there by yourself? All by myself with my tape recorder. Any people downstairs? Any no anyone one. other than you call them beforehand to not say to my you knowledge. better do this? Not to my knowledge. And what did the children generally have to say about Michael Jackson? Nothing but nice things. How how gracious he was to them when they were at Neverland, how much they loved being at Neverland, and how they couldn't wait to go back to Neverland. And if they were going to extort money, why make the criminal allegations as opposed to just suing them? Well, it's been my experience that if you can get a criminal conviction against someone, it makes a civil case a slam dunk or much, much easier. I believe, from what I was told at the time and what I observed, when they started making threats, Michael realized this was not a family he needed around him. And I think he would have done anything he could at that time to distance himself from them or to distance them from him? The, the answer to the question would be no, though. So you're saying that Michael Jackson was already nervous that this family might make allegations against him? I don't know that Michael was so nervous. They were trying to do whatever they could to take care of what they saw as a potential problem, a loose cannon, someone who was very well knowledgeable of the 93 event or allegations and had threatened to do something similar and that's why it's so interesting that we have the same cast of characters you think the boy was up to that or just his mother from what I understand the boy apparently is also or was very much aware of the uh, 1993 case so you think the 13 year old 12 year old boy suffering from cancer is thinking about the big payout from Michael Jackson I will tell you, Dan, that this family, every conversation I had with them, every meeting I had with them, any interaction with them centered around either money, fame, celebrity, and or possessions.